It's Friday, March 11th. I'm Miki Yamamoto in Tokyo. On this day in 2011, a massive earthquake and tsunami hit northeastern Japan. Huge waves destroyed communities along the country's Pacific coast. In this hour, we bring you special coverage in our series, Journey from Disaster. We'll take you live to the memorial ceremony in Tokyo for a moment of silence at 2 46 p.m., the exact time the quake struck. The magnitude 9 quake was the worst in Japan's recorded history, and its effects are still being felt today. The quake triggered a triple meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and spread highly radioactive materials over a wide area. Efforts to decommission the plant are expected to take 40 years. The damage from the tsunami and earthquake has been enormous. Nearly 16,000 people died, and after five years, more than 2,500 are still missing. Some 470,000 people were forced from their homes. Over 170,000 remain in temporary housing. Rikuzen Takata was one of the towns most heavily damaged by the tsunami. This is Rikuzen Takata today. In 2011, a towering wave moved in this direction. The center of the town was right about here. The tsunami washed away the main part of the town. Today, NHK World's Minori Takao is standing by in Rikuzen Takata. Minori, tell us what's going on there today. Miki, it has been a solemn day here in Rikuzen Takata. We just saw hundreds of people filing into the community hall where a memorial ceremony is taking place. It just got underway a few minutes ago. Most of the people who are inside attending are those who lost family members.、Uh, it is the first time an official ceremony is being held here because、uh, the hall itself was completed just last spring. And just minutes from now at 2 46 p.m., the exact time the quake struck, we will be observing a moment of silence here to pray for the victims of the disaster. Now, Rikuzen and Takata had a population of about 24,000 people, but because of the disaster, about 1,800 of them died or went missing. Now, here's a look at what the city looked like before the disaster. The coastline boasted a beautiful beach and 70,000 pine trees that attracted tourists from across the country. The city center was near the bay and packed with shops, schools, and neighborhoods. But then, all of that changed on March 11, 2011. Waves as high as 17 meters gushed inland, wiping everything out. And of the pine grove by the coast, only one tree was left standing. Over the past five years, thousands of Nikuzen Takata's residents have lived in temporary housing. Recovery efforts are being made to rebuild infrastructure, but it's been a gradual process. Tons of soil is being piled up around the coast in order to elevate the land to prevent future disasters. But it will take another few years for this to be completed. Now, while the focus has seemed to be on the future, we have to remember that today. It is about the people who were lost and the people who lost loved ones. A large tent has been created on the grounds of this community hall today, especially for another ceremony being held here.、Uh, people, not just from Rikuzen Takata, have gathered from across the country and they are paying their respects today at 2 46. PM here too, we will be observing a moment of silence. I will be bringing you that moment and we'll be sharing the stories of some of those who have gathered here today. Back to you. Thank you, Minori. Now, thriving communities need stable populations and businesses to serve them, but reconstruction in the disaster area has taken longer than expected. That means residents and business alike are finding it difficult to plan for the future. NHK World's Chie Yamagishi explains. This prefab shelter has been Hideo Karino's home for nearly five years. 
The thin walled two room box is very big enough for Karino and his wife Mariko. It's a really tight squeeze. The Karinos once lived with their son, his wife, and their three children in a two story house. This was our old house. The tsunami destroyed it. There were no temporary units available for large families, so they were forced to split up. In coastal areas, flat ground at higher elevations is in short supply. Municipal officials decided to create new residential sites higher up and far from the sea. But all that takes time. Officials have to draft relocation plans, identify landowners, and gain their consent. Fewer than 100 of the nearly 500 homes planned in this town have been completed. Karino recently paid a visit to a couple who just moved into their new home. Our new house feels spacious since the temporary unit was so small. There's no room to stretch out in those cramped prefabs. Site preparation has just begun on the plot where the Karino family's new house is supposed to be built. They've been told actual construction won't begin for another two years. Many residents of temporary units have gotten tired of waiting and moved away. Karino feels anxious about his family's future. It's been a long time, too long. Rebuilding businesses lost in the tsunami has also been a difficult process. This temporary shopping district in the town of Minami Sandiku opened a year after the disaster. It has 32 shops. Mitsuru Oikawa runs a restaurant here. Time really flew at first because I was working so hard. Government built these structures soon after the disaster. Businesses were initially offered free rent. Next spring, a permanent shopping mall will be built on higher ground. But with the town's population shrinking, some people wonder where the customers will come from. I've been running this business for over four years, and I feel like I've had fewer customers every year. 30% of the town's residents have left. Oikawa has doubts about moving to the new mall. Oikawa and other shop owners are carefully considering their options. We should talk about how to expand our market and gain new customers. There will be no subsidies at the permanent facility. Tenants will have to pay a security deposit as well as rent. We'll be treated like ordinary tenants there. We'll have to pay rent, which will quadruple our operating costs. The new mall is scheduled to open in one year's time. Oikawa and others are worried about how many of the residents will choose to remain. Chie Yamagishi, NHK World. The damage from the disaster was not just physical, it's also left deep psychological scars on the people who survived. And for some, the passage of time has only made things worse and added to their stress. They've spent five years struggling to find meaning in life. NHK World's Yoshiko Nakata reports. 64-year-old Kazuya Shizukuishi lives alone in a temporary shelter in the city of Ishinomaki. When the earthquake struck, Shizukuishi was not at home. The tsunami swept his house away. He lost the wife he adored and his two daughters and father. After the disaster, Shizukuishi began trying to put the pieces of his life back together. But over time, he sank into loneliness and despair. I'm all alone. I've lived a full life until then, and all of a sudden I was left like this. On this day, Shizukuishi has a visitor, a caseworker. Nobuyasu Takayanagi has been providing survivors with mental health care.
Takaya Nagi says survivors sometimes have trouble expressing their feelings. Even if they don't talk about their feelings or problems, the appearance of their living space can speak volumes. That's why I think it's important to go and talk to them face to face. Takaya Nagi works for a private mental health care drop-in center. It was established by local psychiatrists three months after the disaster and is subsidized by local governments. The counseling records of the survivors reflect their growing desperation. I have no courage and I can't move forward. I'm a worthless human being. I feel so lonely and sad. I want to die. Some survivors who are moving from temporary shelters to public housing could end up feeling even more isolated. 77-year-old Akifumi Oguro is one such person. His house was completely destroyed in the tsunami, and his wife passed away the following year. Last August, Oguro moved to this new apartment complex, but he feels lonelier now. When I was in the temporary unit, I could hear the sounds of people nearby. They would make noise as they went past and ask me how I was doing. Here, things are different. I'm sealed in. It's scary just being here. I wonder what would happen if I collapsed. In February, Oguro attended a monthly gathering with the encouragement of staff members at the mental health center. It brought together 21 men who now live alone. Many, like Oguro, had shut themselves up at home. I'm not much of a talker, but when I come here, I can chat. I think it's a good place, and I like coming here. There is more to recovery than putting up buildings. I think it also means creating environments where people can regain the things they've lost, such as communicating with others and the sense of belonging to a community. Shizuku Ishii says time alone won't ease his sense of loss, but he says he found one important reason to keep going. As long as I live, I'll keep my family's memory alive and tend to their graves. That's my mission as a person who was left alive. I don't know how long I'll live, but I'll do it as long as I can. The passage of time means nothing to survivors trying to come to terms with their ordeal, but a community of caring people could provide one important way to help them move forward. Now, let's go back to Minori Takao in Rikuzen, Takata, a city hard hit by the disaster. Minori, how did people there mark 2.46 p.m.? Yes, Mickey. exactly at that time we heard a siren go off throughout the city. It resonated and at that moment people bowed their heads, put their hands together in prayer and we saw many people in tears. One of the women I was able to speak to told me that she came to this ceremony with her two nieces. These girls had lost their mother. This is the woman's sister. And over the past five years, not once did they say anything weak. But just recently at the dinner table, the two girls all of a sudden said, wouldn't it be so nice if we could eat mother's cooking just one more time? So even after five years, people are really still coming to terms with what they've lost. And the service is still going on inside this hall. Um, the city office, of course, hopes to continue to hold the ceremony here because it has so much meaning. The place in front of you called the Singapore Hall is named after the country because of the donations that were collected from the people there. It helped to build this place. And of course, a lot of support has poured in to the tsunami hit region from across the globe. And every time I go anywhere in the Tohoku area, people tell me how grateful they are of the support they've received and they want to say so through NHK World. All that is adding to the momentum of the recovery efforts here 
This is a diorama on display of what the city center will look like in three years' time. At the center is a major shopping area, and this will start construction this summer. So such visible signs of moving forward will hopefully give residents a clearer picture of what their future will look like. The past five years has been a time of sorrow and a test of patience. And of course the challenges are far from over, but people in this community, people I've talked to, tell me they're not about to let their community fall apart. Back to you. Thank you, Minori. Minori Takao in Rikuzen, Takata. Now in the studio, we have Newsline's Editor-in-Chief, Miki Ebara. Miki, I'd like to turn our eyes with you now mm -hmm. to the enormous support Japan got from overseas in the aftermath of the disaster. Mm -hmm. I recall it was very quick and overwhelming. Yes, that's right. The speed and the scale of the international assistance were both unprecedented. I was going through a list of which countries sent what to Japan at the time, and just the list is amazing. More than 20 countries dispatched either search and rescue or medical teams to Japan. About half of them arrived within three days of the earthquake. South Korean and Singaporean teams were here already the next day. And of course, we remember the Tomodachi operation of the U.S. military, and goods such as food, water, generators, and blankets came to shelters. Over 160 countries and international organizations sent all this assistance. And cash donations totaled to $80 million, but that came through uh, only government channels. So if you want to include what came through private or individual channels, we don't know. We simply don't know the, the amount. And the help wasn't only for emergency res uh, response, but infrastructures, such as um, where Minori was reporting from, um, the community hall in Rikuzen Takada is called Singapore Hall, hall because they got so much donations from that country. Um, and in Minami Sanriku, almost half of the funds to build a new hospital um, came from Taiwan. And a new fish, fish processing facility in the town of Onagawa was built thanks to a donation from Qatar. So just the list is so long and goes on. Mm, yes, many victims have told us that they were so heartwarming and encouraging in a time mm -hmm. where there was nothing more than despair and loss. Mm -hmm. So what do you think we can learn from these experiences? I think we can say that until five years ago, Japan had been one of the helpers and not of the helped. Um, but after this disaster, we n now know what sort of help is really needed when such a uh, disaster strikes. And I think what's most important is many of us um, now understand how people feel when they are hit by such a disaster, that it takes time to heal, that it needs gentle and reaching hands of others to stand up again and to rehabilitate. There's increasing attention on the need for mental health and psychological support during and after emergency situations around the world, be it disasters or war, so Japan can share its experience. We also know now the huge role of volunteers play, you know, what they can play in the process of recovery. Even after five years, volunteers, including foreign nationals, go back to the affected region. In the beginning, they helped with the cleanup or delivering food, but over the period, they've become friends with the locals. And some go there to give moral support, which sometimes can be more important than material assistance. Well, talking about making friends, you have reported about some special bonds being created between Japan and other countries. Mm -hmm. Well, there were about 30 foreigners who lost their lives in the disaster, inclu including two young Americans. And I recently interviewed the bereaved families and friends. Uh, members of both their families have been back to the affected region many times and been helping local children's education or student exchanges and con continuing the legacy of the loved ones, both of whom happen to be working as English teachers. And I'm sure there are countless other cases like this happening across Japan. The 311 disaster did horrific damage to thousands of people in Japan, but it's also true that many positive things, such as in a new friendship or a new cooperation between 
people have come into being and that I think is giving strength to the affected region and beyond. Thank you, Miki. New Science Editor-in-Chief Miki Ebara. Now, as we come to the end of our series, Journey from Disaster, we bring you some messages from survivors and families of victims. I feel stuck. It's already been five years, but on the other hand, it's only been five years. We have to be careful not to rebuild our region in the wrong way. We're responsible for building a foundation and handing it over to future generations with a sense of hope. I still live in temporary housing. Reconstruction is still in progress. I hope we can make our town even better than before with the help from people from across the country and overseas. Absolutely grateful to the people of Rikas and Taka for accepting Monty as a member of their families and as a friend and uh, they gave him a second home and, and I have a lot of peace knowing that he was not alone. Five years of thanks for re remembering our daughter Taylor, for giving t time, money, letters, um, prayers uh, to us uh, um, for our healing. I think we're part way back to the life that we had before the disaster, although a lot of things are still not like before. But our family is getting by. It's good. We've received heartfelt support from all over the world, which helped us live through each day. I feel nothing but gratitude. I just want to keep moving forward. Right now, I'm full of vitality, driving myself ahead.